This video is going to be about linearization. Linearization is kind of what it sounds like. It means to re-graph a function to turn it into a straight line or to linearize it, if that helps you to think about it. We want to do this because straight line graphs are easy to predict. They have a y-intercept and a slope, and we can use both of these things to make predictions about our data. So if we have a clear, simple pattern for our data, a simple slope and a simple y-intercept, we can use that to predict what our data will do in the future or for values that we haven't graphed yet. So that's why we want to linearize a function. You may know that the equation for a linear line is y equals mx plus b. So the idea here is that we want to rewrite other formulas, other equations, so that they take this form y equals mx plus b and become a straight line. What this means is that we're going to have to decide on a dependent variable to put on our y, um, y axis and set that equal to some constant m multiplied by the thing that we're graphing on our x-axis, the independent variable, plus the y-intercept, some other constant. Once we have the equation arranged in this way, m will be equal to the slope, b will be equal to the y-intercept, and the function itself will be a straight line. I'll give you an example of what I mean by this, what I mean to linearize a function. So I'm going to make a graph of this function here, y equals 10x squared plus 2. And I'm going to try to figure out what I can do to re-graph this function, to linearize it, so that it becomes a straight line. Because you probably know that if you get the y values for that function, here I'm going to take x is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And when I plug that into the function, these are the y values that come out. And when I graph them, the graph looks like this, which you can see is clearly not a straight line. So the reason we don't like these kinds of graphs in physics is because we can't really make useful predictions using this graph. It's curving upwards, and I'm not sure exactly where it's going to be in the future, just using the pattern itself. Obviously, I can calculate the values using the equation itself, but I want to be able to use the pattern of the graph itself to be able to predict future numbers. So I want to be able to turn this graph into a straight line. Well, to do that, we just need to make this function y equals 10x squared plus 2 match the form of a linear line, which is y equals mx plus b. Or dv, the thing on the y-axis, is equal to m times iv, the thing on the x-axis, plus b. I know that when I do that, it's 100% guaranteed that the end result is going to be a linear line with a y-intercept of b and a slope of m. So we just need to make this particular function match this general equation for a linear line. So I can see that I should probably graph y on my y-axis. y is taking the place of dv in this form, so that part's pretty simple. And then I can see that my m is probably going to be 10, just because that's a constant being multiplied by my variable. So I'm assuming that m is going to be my slope. This is where it gets a little weird. Instead of graphing x on the independent variable axis, on the x-axis, we're actually going to graph x squared, because that's what's showing up in the iv portion of this equation. So instead of writing x, I'm going to graph x squared on the x-axis. If you're confused about what that means, I'm going to show you an example in just a minute. But the reason why I'm doing that is just because x squared is taking the place of iv in this particular setup. And I can see that b here is going to be equal to 2. So I matched up my function with the general equation of a linear line. And so this is telling me that if I put y on my, x, on my y axis and x squared on the horizontal axis instead of x, and this is important, I'm graphing x squared instead of x, it will definitely 100% be the case that my y-intercept will be 2 and my slope will be 10 for this particular function. So let's see what happens. Um, what do I mean when I say graph x squared instead of x? What that means is that for every x that's producing a y, I'm going to square that x and put that on the axis instead. So if I square each x number that's matched up with a y, this is what I get. So 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, so on and so forth. So now I have a column of x squared and a column of y. So according to my linearization function, these are the two things that I'm going to want to graph, x squared on the horizontal axis, y on the vertical axis. And my linearization rule is telling me that if I do that, I'll get a linear line with a y-intercept of 2 and a slope of 10. So let's try that. I'm going to replace all those x numbers with x squared. And it's important to understand that I'm still matching these numbers. So 4 is going with 42 rather than 2, 9 is going with 92 rather than 3, so on and so forth. So I'm still matching each of those x numbers. When I do that, this is what the graph looks like. And I find that some students stop here and get a little confused and say, just because I replace these with different numbers doesn't mean that this graph is linear. You can see that it's still the same shape. But the problem with that idea is that because these are new numbers, we have to separate them by the correct spaces. Because you can see right now the spaces are wrong. 1 to 4 is just as long as 4 to 9 or 9 to 16. But we know that that's wrong. Each number is going to, be half, is going to have to be separated by the correct amount. 
So when I drag out this graph and keep the data the same, but I separate out these numbers so that the um, intervals between each space is the correct length, so the length from 4 to 0 is 4 times as long as 1 to 0, I can see that the result is a linear graph with a slope of 10 and a y-intercept of 2. So just like the rule predicted, if I match x squared with y instead of just x with y, I'm going to get a linear graph as a result. So that's how you linearize a function. And here, 10x squared plus 2 is linearized, and I can use this to make future predictions about what these numbers will be. So to linearize, you're basically going to have to take two steps. You have to separate the variables and the constants, and set the iv and dv equal to the variables in their place, and set the m and b equal to the constants in their place. I'm going to give you a few examples of this just to make sure you're clear. Let's take the equation v squared equals 2as and linearize it. I'm assuming here that a is a constant. So that means that my two variables are v and s. And if I were to graph just v and s, that would not result in a linear line. But if I graph different, slightly altered variables, that should result in a linear line. So if I bring my equation down here, I can see that v squared is taking the place of dv. So I'm going to say that dv is equal to v squared. That's the thing that I would put on the dependent variable axis. And I can see that s is the only variable that's taking the place of the independent variable, because 2 and a are both constants. They're not variables, so they're not a part of the iv. So iv here is just equal to the variable s. The gradient is just a fancy name for the slope, and here you can see that the slope is going to be whatever number is multiplied by that independent variable. And here that constant that's being multiplied is 2 times a, so the slope is 2 times a. And there's nothing in the place of b, there's nothing being added to this, so that means that the y-intercept is just 0. And that's how you would linearize this function. If you graph v squared on the y-axis and s on the x-axis, you will definitely 100% end up with a function with a slope of 2a and a y-intercept of 0. So that's useful for solving problems. Here's a more complicated equation, we'll actually be working with this later this year. You don't have to understand what any of these equations mean in order to linearize them. You just have to know what are the constants and what are the variables. And here you can see that the constants are capital G, big M, and small m. And so I'm going to bring this equation down and try to manipulate it, because it's not entirely clear to me how I can get variables multiplied by constants here. I do see that f is taking the place of dv, so f is probably going to be my dv, but I now need to separate the constants from the variables. One thing I can try is to get the constants onto one side of this fraction. So I know that um, a numerator over a denominator in a fraction is equal to that numerator times 1 over the denominator. So I kind of took the constants out and multiplied them on the side there. And now that I have 1 over r squared, I know that that's e actually equal to r to the power of negative 2. So 1 over a variable to any power is equal to that variable to the negative version of that power. So I'm just using that rule here. So now I have a variable is equal to some constant times a variable raised to some power. So if I don't have any constants in the variable section itself, that means I can make it my iv or my dv. So here my dv is f, and my iv is going to be r to the power of negative 2. And the slope is just going to be what's multiplied by my iv, which is going to be capital G, capital M, lowercase m. And again, here the y-intercept is 0. Moving on to the next one, just to show you a more complicated equation, we have f is equal to av plus bv squared. And my constants are a and b, so that means that my two variables are going to be f and v. And there's a difficulty here where the variable is showing up in two different spots, v and v squared, and it's being raised to different powers, so we need to figure out what we can do about that. This equation is a reminder that linearization gives us a lot of freedom. It gives us a lot of wiggle room to move things around and to graph basically anything that we want, as long as we have only variables in the dv and iv and only constants in m and b, we can make that graph and we'll know 100% that it's linear. So I'm going to try to get just variables and just constants. I'm going to start by um, factoring out v. I think that would be useful here, just because we do want v in only one spot, or we want to take out variables from constants whenever we can. So now that I have that, I can divide both sides by v, and I actually get something that approximates a linear function already. So you can see here that f divided by v is taking the place of my dependent variable, um, and then v is taking the place of my independent variable. It's being multiplied by a constant b. So that means that my dv is f over v, my iv is just v itself, the gradient is what's being multiplied by v, so that's b, and the constant here, the y-intercept, is going to be a. Some students get a little confused by this, and they say, well, like, how is it that you can graph both variables on one axis, like we have both f and v on one axis, and that's entirely fair game. It doesn't matter exactly which variables you put where, all that matters is that there are only variables in the dv and iv section, and only constants in the m and b section. If you're obeying that rule, you can linearize the function, and you can get a little creative with it like we did here. 
One more example just to show you how complicated but also how easy this can be. Um, we're going to be using the equation i equals i naught times e to the power of negative a times capital T. And we know that the constants are i naught and a. Again, you don't have to have any idea what this function is actually talking about in order to linearize it. You just need to know what the constants are, in this case i naught and a, and what the variables are, which in this case are going to be i and capital T. So let's see if we can linearize this. So I know that there's a rule where I'm probably going to take the natural log of both sides of this function. If you remember from previous classes, if you want to get variables out of an exponent of e, you're probably going to end up taking the natural log of that number. So if I take the natural log of both sides, I get the natural log of i is equal to the natural log of i naught e to the power of negative a times capital T. And if I remember some rules about natural log from math class, I'll remember that this is equal to that same thing, except instead of that full natural log on the side, it's just going to be natural log of i naught plus negative a times capital T. And I can see that this is basically in a linearized form if I switch these two things around, because I now have a dv, which is going to be lin of i, and it's going to be equal to some constant, negative a, times a variable, t, plus another constant, which is the natural log of i naught. So when I put that in, I get my um, dependent variable is lin of i, and my independent variable is capital T. The gradient is going to be negative a, that's what's being multiplied by t, and the y-intercept that's taking the place of b is the natural log of i naught. Again, you don't have to have any idea what these numbers are actually talking about in, um, in order to be able to linearize them. And in most of the labs that we'll do in this class, it'll actually be the other way around. You're going to start by linearizing a function and later use the lab to understand what these numbers mean. So in conclusion, these are the two steps that you have to take to linearize a function. And on the bottom, you can see the form that all linear functions take. dv is equal to m times iv plus b. So you can use this for most functions that we deal with in this class, and this will come up over and over again in your lab reports throughout the year. That's all you need to know. Thank you for watching.